Hey y'all, I am tired today. Last night, the wind was, was horrendous and we weren't prepared for it like we are normally. So we've got a 40 foot by 12 foot frame that we throw tarps over so that we can use it for storage. And I just replaced the tarp for it and didn't secure the tarp down because it's been calm the last few days. And so we had a couple of ropes, we had a couple of things like that over top of it. And then we had horrendous wind. So it became quite the adventure to try to get the tarp back down, get everything taken care of, and then we live in an RV, so the whole night our RV was not any normal rotations, was just jerking and shaking and flipping and, not flipping, sorry, but I mean, ugh, made for a long, long night and I am tired. Anyway, you guys didn't come for that, you guys came for borrowers of field. However, if you do like some of my stories and you would like to know more about me, more about what I do, my thoughts, my interworkings, my whatever, go ahead and head over to Papa Ben's vlogs and that'll give you kind of some quirky, weird insights into this uh, redneck slash whatever's. Anyway, on to chapter 20. If you remember, they had just decided to go into the uh, lockbox to see who's in there. They filed in through the gothic shape hole in the wainscot, a little nervous, a little shy. It was shadowy inside, like a cave. Disappointingly, it felt uninhabited and smelled of dust and mice. Oh dear, muttered Homily incredulously. Is this how they live? She stopped suddenly and picked up some object on the floor. Oh my goodness, she whispered aside excitedly to Pod. Do you know what this is? And she brandished something whitish under his nose. Yes, said Pod. It's a bit of quill pipe cleaner. Put it down, homily, and come on, do. Spiller's waiting. It's the spout of our old oak apple teapot, persisted Homily. That's what it is. I'd know it anywhere, and it's no good telling me any different. So they are here, she mused wonderingly as she followed Pod into the shadows to where Spiller with Arietti stood waiting. We go up here, said Spiller, and Homily saw that he stood with his hand on a ladder. Glancing up to where the rungs soared away above them into dimness. She gave a slight shudder. The ladder was made of matchsticks, neatly glued and spliced to two lengths of split cane, such as florists use to support potted plants. I'll go first, said Pod. We'd better take it one at a time. Homily watched fearfully until she heard his voice from above. It's all right he whispered from some invisible eerie. Come on up. Homily followed, her knees trembling, and emerged at last onto the dim lit platform beside Pod, an aerial landing stage. That was what it seemed like, which creaked a little when she stepped on it and almost seemed to sway. Below lay hollow darkness, ahead an open door. Oh my goodness, she muttered. I do hope it's safe. Don't look down, she advised Arietti, who came up next. But Arietti had no temptation to look down. Her eyes were on the lighted doorway and the moving shadows within. She heard the faint sound of voices and a sudden high-pitched laugh. Come on, said Spiller, slipping past her and making toward the door. Arietti never forgot her first sight of the upstairs room. The warmth, the sudden cleanness, 
the winking candlelight and the smell of home cooked food. And so many voices, so many people. Gradually, in a dazed way, she began to sort them out. That must be Aunt Lupi embracing her mother. Aunt Lupi, so round and glowing. Her mother, so smudged and lean. Why did they cling and weep, she wondered, and squeeze each other's hands? They had never liked each other. All the world knew that. Homley had thought Lupi stuck up because, back in the big house, Lupi had lived in the drawing room and changed for dinner at night. And Lupi despised Homley for living under the kitchen and for pronouncing parquet, parquet. And here was Uncle Henry, his beard grown thinner, telling her father that this could not be Arietti, and her father with pride telling Uncle Henry it could. Those must be the three boy cousins whose names she had not caught, graduated in size, but as like as peas in a pod. And this thin, tall, fairy-like creature, neither old nor young, who hovered shyly in the background with a faint, uneasy smile. Who was she? Humley screamed when she saw her and clapped her hand to her mouth. It can't be Eglatina. It evidently could. Arietti start too, wondering if she had heard all right. Eglatina, that long lost cousin who one fine day escaped from under the floor and was never seen again. A kind of legend she had been to Arietti, and a lifelong cautionary tale. Well, here she was, safe and sound, unless they were all dreaming. And well, they might be. There was something strangely unreal about this room. Furnished with doll's house furniture of every shape and size, none of it matching or in proportion. There were chairs upholstered in rep or velvet, some of them too small to sit in, and some too steep and large. There were chevrons, which were too tall, and occasional tables far too low, and a toy fireplace with color plaster coals and its fire irons stuck up all of a piece with the finder. There were two make-believe windows with curved pelments and red satin curtains, each hand-painted with an imitation view. One looked out on a Swiss mountain scene, the other a highland glen. There were table lamps and standard lamps, flounced, festooned, and tasseled. But the light in the room, Arietti noticed, came from the humble, familiar dips like those they had made at home. Everybody looked extraordinary clean, and Arietti became even shyer. She threw a quick glance at her father and mother and was not reassured. None of their clothes had been washed for weeks, nor for some days had their hands and faces. Pod's trousers had its hair in one knee, and Homily's hair hung down in shakes. And here was Aunt Lupi, plump and polite, begging Homily please to take off her things in a kind voice. Arietti imagined, usually reserved for feather boas, opera cloaks, and freshly cleaned white kid gloves. But Homily, who back at home had so dreaded being caught out in a spoiled apron, knew one worth two of that. She had, Pod and Arietti noticed with pride, adopted her woman tried beyond endurance role backed up by one called, Yes, I've suffered, but don't let's speak of it now. She had invited a new smile, Wayne, but brave, and had, in the same good cause, plucked the last hairpins out of her dust-filled hair. Poor 
dear Loopy, she was saying, glancing worriedly about. What a lot of furniture. Whoever helps you with the dusting. And swaying a little, she sank on a chair. They rushed to support her, as she hoped they might. Water was brought, and they bathed her face and hands. Henry stood with the tears in his brotherly eyes. Poor, valiant soul, he muttered, shaking his head. Your mind kind of reels when you think of what she's been through. Then, after quick wash and brush up all round, and a brisk bit of eye-wiping, they all sat down to supper. This they ate in the kitchen, which was rather a come-down, except that in here the fire was real. A splendid cooking range made of a large black door lock. They poked the fire through the keyhole, which glowed handsomely, and the smoke, they were told, went through a series of pipes to the cottage chimney behind. The long white table, which richly spread, it was an 18th century finger plate of some old drawing room door, white enameled and painted with forget-me-nots, supported firmly on four stout pencil stubs, where once the screws had been. The points of the pencils emerged slightly through the top of the table. One was copying ink, and they were warned not to touch it in case it stained their hands. There was every kind of dish and preserve, both real and false. Pies, puddings, and bottled fruits out of season, all cooked by Loopy, and an imitation leg of mutton and a desk of plaster tarts borrowed from the doll's house. There were real tumblers as well as acorn cups and a couple of green glass decanters. Talk, talk, talk. Arietti listening felt dazed. She saw now why they had been expected. Spiller, she gathered, having found the alcove bootless and its inmates flown, had salvaged their few possessions and had run and told young Tom. Loopy felt a little faint suddenly when they mentioned this person by name and had a, to leave the table. She sat a while in the next room on a frail gilt chair placed just inside the doorway. Between drafts, as she put it, feigning her round red face with a lark's feather. Mothers like this about humans, explained the eldest cousin. It's no good telling her he's tame as anything and wouldn't hurt a fly. You never know, said Loopy darkly from her seat in the doorway. He's nearly full grown, and that, they say, is when they start to be dangerous. Loopy's right, agreed Pod. I'd never trust him myself. Oh, how can you say that, cried Arietti. Look at the way he snatched us right up out of the jaws of death. Snatched you up, screamed Loopy from the next room. You mean with his hands? Homily gave her brave little laugh listlessly chasing a gullible of raspberry round her too slippery plate. Naturally, she shrugged. It was nothing, really. Oh, dear, stammered Loopy faintly. Oh, you poor thing. Imagine it, I think, she went on. If you'll excuse me a moment, I'll just, I'll just go and lie down. And she heaved her weight off the tiny chair, which rocked as she left it. Where did you get all this furniture, Hendry? Asked Homily, recovering suddenly now that Loopy had gone. It was delivered, her brother told her, in a plain white pillowcase. Someone from the big house brought it down. From our house? Asked Pod. Stands to reason, said Hendry. It's all stuff from that doll's house, remember? They had upstairs in the schoolroom. Top shelf of the toy cupboard on the right-hand side of the door. Well, naturally, I remember, said Homily, seeing that some of it's mine. 
pity, she remarked aside to Arietti, that we didn't keep that inventory. She lowered her voice. The one you made on blotting paper? Remember? Arietti nodded. There were going to be fireworks later. She could see that. She felt very tired suddenly. There seemed too much talk, and the crowded room felt hot. Who brought it down? Pod was asking in a surprised voice. Some kind of human being? We reckon so, agreed Hendry. It was lying there, other side of the bank. Soon after, we got turned out of the badger set, and had set up house in the stove. What stove was that? asked Pod. Not the one by the camping site. That's right, Henry told him. Two years we lived there, off and on. A bit too close to the gypsies for my liking, said Pod. He cut himself a generous slice of hot boiled chestnut and spread it thickly with butter. You got to be close, Henry explained. Like it or not, when you got to borrow. Pod, about to bite, withdrew the chestnut. He seemed amazed. You borrowed from caravans? He exclaimed. At your age? Henry shrugged slightly with a modestly silent. Well, I never, said Humley admiringly. There's a brother for you. You think what that means, Pod? I am thinking, said Pod. He raised his head. What did you do about smoke? You don't have none, Hendry told him. Not when you cook on gas. On gas? exclaimed Humley. That's right. We borrowed a bit of gas from the gas company. They got a pipe laid all along that bank. The stove was resting on its back, like you remember. We dug down behind through the flue. A good six weeks we spent in that tunnel. Worth it in the end, though. Three pinhole burners we had down there. How did you turn them on and off? asked Pod. We didn't. Once lit, we never let them out. Still burning they are to this day. You mean that you still go back there? Henry, yawning slightly, shook his head. Spiller lives there, he said. Oh, exclaimed Humley. So that's how Spiller cooked. So that's what those bones were. He might have told us. She went on looking about it in a hurt way. Or, at any rate, asked us in. He wouldn't do that, said Henry. Once bitten, twice shy, as you might say. How, how do you mean? asked Homily. After we left the badger set, began Hendry, and broke off slightly shamefaced, he seemed, in spite of his smile, well, that stove was one of his places. He asked us in for a bite and a sup, and we stayed a couple of years. Once you'd struck gas, you mean, said Pod. That's right, said Hendry. We cooked, and Spiller borrowed. Ah, said Pod. Spiller borrowed. Now I understand. You and me, Hendry, we got to face up to it. We're not as young as we was. Not by a long chalk. Where is Spiller now? Asked Arietti suddenly. Oh, he's gone off, said Hendry vaguely. He seemed a little embarrassed and sat there frowning and tapping the table with a pewter spoon. Gone off where? asked Hendry. Home, I reckon, Hendry told her. But we haven't thanked him, cried Arietti. Spiller saved our lives. Hendry threw off his gloom. Have a drop of blackberry cordial, he suggested suddenly to Pod. Loopy's own make. Cheer us all up. Not for me, said Homily firmly before Pod could speak. No good never comes of that as we've found out to our cost.
But what will Spiller think? Persisted Arietti. And there were tears in her eyes. We haven't even thanked him. Hendry looked at her, surprised. Spiller? He don't hold with thanks. He's all right. And he patted Arietti's arm. What? Why didn't he stay for supper? He don't ever, Hendry told her. Doesn't like company. He'll cook something on his own. Where? In his stove. But that's miles away. Not for Spiller. He's used to it. Goes part way by water. And it must be getting dark, Arietti went on unhappily. Now don't you fret about Spiller, her uncle told her. You eat up your pie. Arietti looked down at her plate. Somehow she had no appetite. She raised her eyes. And when will he be back? She asked anxiously. He don't come back much. Once a year for his new clothes. Or if young Tom sends him special. Arietti looked thoughtful. He must be lonely. She ventured at last. Spiller? No. I wouldn't say he was lonely. Some borrowers is made like that. Solitary. You got him now and again. He glanced across the room to where his daughter, having left the table, was sitting alone by the fire. Eglatina's a bit like that. Pity. But you can't do nothing about it. Them's the ones as gets this craze for humans. Kind of man-eaters they turns out to be. When Lupi returned, refreshed from her rest, it all began again. Talk, talk, talk. And Arietti slipped unnoticed from the table. But as she wandered away toward the other room, she heard it going on, talking about living arrangements and the construction of a suite of rooms upstairs, about what pitfalls there were in this new way of life and the rules they had made to avoid such pitfalls. How you always drew the ladder up last thing at night, but that it should never be moved while the men were out borrowing. That the young boys went out as learners each in turn, but that true to borrowing tradition, the women would stay at home. She heard her mother declining the use of the kitchen. Thank you, Loopy, Humley was saying. It's very kind of you, but we'd better begin as we mean to go on. Don't you think? Quite separate. And so it starts again, thought Arietti. As entering the next room, she seated herself in a stiff armchair, but no longer quiet under the floor. Up a little. They would be, now, among the laugh and plaster. There would be ladders instead of dusty passages, and that platform she hoped might do instead of her grating. She glanced about her at the over-furnished room, the doll's house leftovers suddenly looked silly. Everything for show, nothing much for use. The false coals in the fireplace looked worn, as though scrubbed too often by Lupi, and then painted views in the windows had finger marks round the edge. She wondered how the dim-lit platform, this, with its dust and shadows, had she known of such things, was something like going backstage. The ladder was in place, she noticed, a sign that someone was out, but in this case, not so much out has gone. Poor Spiller, solitary. They had called him. Perhaps, thought Arietti, self-pitying, that's what's the matter with me. There was a faint light she saw now in the chasm below her, at the what at first had seemed a lessening of darkness seemed now a welcoming glow. Arietti, her heart beating, took hold of the ladder and set her foot on the first rung. If I don't do it now, she thought desperately, this first evening, perhaps in the future, I should never dare again. There seemed too many rules in Aunt Lupi's house, too many people, and the rooms seemed too dark and too hot. There may be compensations, she thought, her knees trembling a little as rung after rung she started to climb down. 
but I'll have to discover them myself. Soon, she stood once again in the dusty entrance hall. She glanced about her, and then nervously, she looked up. She saw the top of the ladder outlined against the light and the jagged edge of the high platform. It made her feel suddenly dizzy and more than a little afraid. Suppose someone, not realizing she was below, decided to pull it up. The faint light, she realized, came from the hole in the wainscoat. The long box, for some reason, was not laid flush against it. There might well be room to squeeze through. She would like to have one more peep at the room in which, some hours before, young Tom had set them down. To have some little knowledge, however fleeting, of this human dwelling, which from now on would compose her world. All was quiet as she stole toward the gothic-shaped opening. The long box she found was a good inch and a half away, and was easy enough to slip out and ease her tiny body along the narrow passage left between the side of the box and the wall. Again, a little frightening. Suppose some human being decided suddenly to shove the long box into place. She would be squashed, she thought, and found long afterwards glued to the wainscoat, like some strange pressed flower. For this reason, she moved fast, and reaching the box's corner, stepped out on the hearth. She glanced about the room. She could see the rafters of the ceiling, the legs of the window chair, and the underside of its seat. She saw a lighted candle on a wooden table, and, by its leg, a pile of skins on the floor. Ah, this, she realized, was the secret to Spiller's wardrobe. Another kind of fur lay on the table, just beyond the candle, above a piece of cloth, tawny yellow and somehow rougher. As she stared at it, it seemed to stir. A cat? A fox? Arietti froze the stillness, but she bravely stood her ground. Now the movement became unmistakable. A rollover and a sudden lifting up. Arietti gasped, a tiny sound, but it was heard. A face looked back at her, candlelit and drowsed with sleep. Below its thatch of hair, there was a long silence. At last, the boy's lips curved softly into a smile, and very young he looked after sleeping very harmless. The arm on which he had rested his head lay loosely on the table, and Arietti, from where she stood, had seen his fingers relax. A clock was ticking somewhere above her head. The candle flame rose, still and steady, lighting the peaceful room. The coals gave a gentle shudder and settled on the grate. Hello, said Arietti. Hello, replied young Tom. Well, that's the end of that book. Hmm. So, what do you think is going to happen in the next book? What do you think? Because the next one is called The Borrowers Afloat. They're in Tom's house right now, ready to go. Everything's going good for them. And now, all of a sudden, something is going to happen to make them afloat. Well, you'll have to tune back in when we get to those chapters or that next book, The Borrowers Afloat. Make sure to go ahead and try to grab your copies of that book too. And you all have a wonderful, wonderful and blessed day.